Lazen was a Chihene Chiricahu Apache woman born in 1840 in present-day New Mexico. She was the younger sister of and right-hand woman to Apache chief Victorio. Lozen is an Apache warrior's title, meaning horse thief. Her birth name is lost to us today, but Lawson's legendary bravery is a true story that I hope will never be lost. Lawson was an expert horse trainer from a young age. Her tribe believed that she had a supernatural power to communicate with horses, and her skills truly were incredible. At the young age of 12, Lawson climbed to a mountaintop in a standard maturation ritual. Atop the mountain, she was blessed with additional gifts to know when and where her enemies would appear. From then on, Lawson sat on her brother's war councils and Victorio said that Lawson was, quote, strong as a man, braver than most, and cunning in strategy. Lawson is a shield to her people, unquote. Lawson and her brother attempted to broker peace many times. Lawson was her tribe's spiritual leader, and it's not a big leap to assume that she wanted peace. The Apache didn't want to fight with the brutal, disease-ridden invaders, but their negotiations were in vain. Therefore, Lawson had no choice but to fight many battles against Mexico and the United States as imperialist settlers continued to shove their way into her territory. Even after being forced onto a reservation, Lawson still fought for rights and freedom for her people. Lawson's party teamed up with Apache chief Geronimo, leading raids across modern-day New Mexico and Arizona. She was eventually confined in Florida and then Alabama. Because of the disgusting conditions and lack of resources given to the indigenous people by their colonial oppressors, Lawson died, like many of her people, of tuberculosis in 1889 and was buried in Alabama in an unmarked grave, as disrespected in death as she was in life. Many who know her story compare Lawson to Joan of Arc, both blessed by their god with gifts of strategy and leadership in times of desperation and war, both killed by the actions of selfish men and underestimated and dismissed as silly little girls by many people for many years. Hello, witches, women, and other lovely listeners. I'm Hannah, the bipolar bisexual host of this bi-weekly podcast of Witches and Women. In this podcast, we get to explore the lives of powerful women, both real and mythological. Strong women have historically been labeled as witches or something else equally troubling, taboo, and easy to justify killing or dismissing. I'm telling their stories because most of these tales are amazing and all of them are fascinating. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, and if you do social media, connect with me through Of Witches and Women on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Of course, be sure you also check out the website, which is the most in-depth and exciting resource I can offer you. When you visit ofwitchesandwomen.com, you'll find fantastic merchandise of both the serious and salty variety. Lots of the merchandise is limited edition, so get it while we're still in ancient Greece. You'll also find the Grimoire Gallery, which is our internet gallery curated with art by today's working artists and featuring witches, women, and goddesses of ancient Greece. If you see something you like, you can support a small business by visiting the artist's portfolio sites to see, share, or purchase more of their work. Plus, you can even buy some of their prints starting at just $15 in the Of Witches and Women shop. If you're not a fan of fake news, then you need to check out the Lamia Library, where I list all of my show notes and other resources and recommendations. Of course, subscribe to the newsletter The Oracle on any page of the Of Witches and Women website. Just scroll down and add your email address. The bi-weekly Oracle tells the shorter, fascinating, more obscure stories that we won't get to cover on the show. It highlights Grimoire Gallery artists, shares simple spells and book recommendations, and more. So don't miss out. Subscribe today.
Once upon a time, Zeus and his nanny wife, <clears throat> the Titaness of Wisdom, Metis, did the quick and dirty. No surprises there. Zeus later discovered a prophecy that Metis would bear his child, a child so fierce that they and only they would have the power to overthrow the mighty Zeus and take Olympus. Like the rest of us, Zeus was really bad at learning from history. So he chased Metis down and ate her before she could give birth. You know, as one does. But hey, at least he was eating his wives and not children, you know, like his father and grandfather before him. <sighs> Zeus went on to marry many others and philander with even more. One day, after marrying Hera, the Queen of Heaven, and having sorted out his role as Supreme Leader, Zeus got a terrible headache. He felt as if his skull was splitting, and that's because it was. Undeterred by gestation in Metis's womb inside of Zeus's stomach, a fully formed woman burst forth, fully clad in armor and weapons. She was, of course, Athena and bore the powers of wisdom, war, and handicraft. Athena was the goddess who oversaw weaving and the goddess who oversaw weapon making. She understood strategy, treaties, and the value of peace and prosperity. And she was the fiercest warrior on Olympus. The boys club was not thrilled. Athena's powers overarched Ares, god of war, Hephaestus, crafter of magnificent weapons, and of course, she was the child strong enough to lead a successful revolution against Big Daddy Zeus. Goddess of Wisdom, Athena was not interested in revolution because, unlike her powerful predecessors, well, she was wise. Her evolved foresight meant she could understand the cost of war better than the god of war ever could. But she was no pushover. Athena refused to marry any of the gods, establishing herself as a maiden goddess, making it impossible for Zeus to control her through alliance or patriarchy. She allied mainly with Poseidon, the earth shaker, but didn't seek out quarrels with any of the gods, with one exception, early in her life, which cemented her as a force not to be reckoned with by all the other gods. That exception, of course, is the Trial of Paris. In the first episode of this podcast, we reviewed Greek history, including the infamous and for centuries mythological Trojan War. We now know that there was a Mycenaean Trojan War that wiped the civilization of Troy off the map. And one of the goddesses responsible was Athena. As we've discussed before, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera were once in conflict over who was the most beautiful among them. They entrapped a young Trojan prince, Paris, to decide, and ultimately the youngest of the three goddesses, Aphrodite, bribed Paris to choose her. This bribe included kidnapping Helen of Sparta and making her Helen of Troy for Paris's enjoyment and Aphrodite's victory, but Athena was not to be crossed, and the two young but powerful goddesses clashed violently, both on Olympus and in the mortal realm. Athena whispered a war cry throughout Sparta, Athens, and all their Greek allies. Her influence and rage fueled the king of Sparta in his quest to reclaim his wife. In the retelling of this wartime tale, it is said that the gods and titans fought on the battlefield themselves, so desperate to prove their dominance. But only one could end a battle fought by thousands of men and dozens of gods. Only Athena had the cunning needed to take and destroy Troy as a message to all who crossed her, including her fellow gods. The various retellings in history, literature, and film all depict the Trojan War very differently. But a running theme throughout it is that Athena whispered in Achilles' ear the strategy of the Trojan horse. After a decade of fighting and well into the endgame, Athena put mortals and gods alike in checkmate. Needless to say, beauty contests were then discouraged on Olympus, and few were foolish enough to risk insult to the goddess of war and strategy. 
Athena was weary of war and of pain. In her later years, she was a patron goddess of knowledge, encouraging philosophy, wisdom, and democracy in her patron city of Athens. It comes as no surprise that the two people who thought themselves important enough to cross the goddess were Big Daddy Zeus and his philandering brother Poseidon. You may have heard the story of how Zeus crossed Athena before, but my guess is you were told only one of the three recorded versions of the tale. And that version is the only one that paints Athena as the villain. I'll tell you the other two versions now. Arachne, a talented young weaver, was sought out throughout the lands for her beautiful, tightly woven fabrics. She had been gifted weaving abilities by the goddess Athena herself. Arachne's fame grew, and from his fluffy cloud throne, Zeus could see that she was being compared to Athena. Well, he couldn't have these mortals thinking themselves talented or industrious or anything without him. So he brought Arachne to Olympus and informed Athena and Arachne that they were to face off in a weaving competition. Athena was reluctant, knowing that Zeus had a punishment in mind for Arachne when she inevitably lost. As Athena was Arachne's mentor, this would hurt Athena as well, reasserting Zeus's dominance. So the two women wove through the night, and Athena wove a plan of action as well. Arachne was then declared the loser and a blasphemer. In the most common account, she's turned into a spider as punishment by Zeus or Athena so that she will be despised and feared by all who once adored her. But in the second account, Arachne hangs herself in shame. And in the third account, Arachne's transformation is actually a rescue effort by Athena. When Arachne inevitably lost the weaving competition, Athena requested that she be allowed to punish the impertinent Arachne. It was Athena who then transformed Arachne into the first spider. When Athena created the first Arachnid, she gave her young student the gift of weaving forever. Without interference or notice from the obnoxious Zeus. I've already told you the tale of Poseidon's assault on Athena and her temple priestess. If you haven't heard the episode on Medusa yet, be sure to check it out, because Athena is the goddess of strategy for a reason, and she shows her talents well in that story. Today's episode is brought to you by Honestly Essential Oils. Unlike the Essential Oil Barons, Honestly Essential Oils is a small, family-run company with fewer employees than I have fingers, all of whom are skilled in different areas of holistic medicine, including the company owner who has more than 26 years of aromatherapy experience and has mixed soothing blends for many large oil companies, written books on holistic medicine, and even run a massage therapy school for many years. Because Honestly Essential Oils doesn't pay a long line of salespeople before the oils reach you, their oils are far less expensive than many other companies. Plus, Honestly Essential Oils are sourced and tested to verify a high concentration of top quality oils in every bottle. Every single Honestly Essential Oil and Carrier Oil is either certified organic, kosher, or vegan, and all of them are completely composed only of the highest quality food grade extracts and oils. Honestly Essential Oils are great for meditation, soothing colds, cooking, or whatever you need. You can try out Honestly Essential Oils for yourself with a 100% satisfaction guarantee and listeners of this podcast get 10% off your first order when you use the promo code WITCHES at checkout. So look up honestlyessential.com today and use the promo code WITCHES for a sweet deal on the best oils a witch can get. Tragically, there really aren't tales of gifted heroines from ancient Greece, which doesn't add up. 
as the patron goddess of the most successful heroes was Athena, a woman who had it all and could do it all, all on her own. But there are women and girls throughout history who have shown their affinity for the goddess's talents. During both world wars, women and Girl Scouts were considered some of the best spies. Joan of Arc, of course, led her people to stunning victories. Malala Yousafzai defended wisdom and education at risk of her life. And of course, Lazen, blessed by her own gods, was a fierce warrior and queen of strategy and wisdom to be reckoned with. May we all appreciate the many Athenian traits in ourselves, our sisters, and our covens. Hello, witchlings! If you love history and mythology shared by Of Witches and Women here with me, be sure to check out the new podcast, Whiskey and Wizards. This also alliterative podcast discusses wizards and sorcerers and history and just how society believed in their magic. Fueled by a new whiskey every episode, Sarah and Robin walk listeners through the life and times of magicians and magic throughout history. In fact, my inside source tells me that today they're releasing an amazing episode on the creation of chaos magic. You can find and subscribe to Whiskey and Wizards on Anchor, Apple, and Google Podcasts, and follow them for new episodes and mini-sodes, so be sure to check them out. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure you and your coven, tribe, squad, and the spider that lives in that one corner of your closet are all subscribed to Of Witches and Women. Why? Because, my witchlings, the stats are in and we've been growing at an exponential rate all year. I need your help to keep that momentum going. So please, please, please leave a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or Google. And I'm not kidding about telling your peeps, even that arachnid, to subscribe. You can connect to the pod on social media and look up ofwitchesandwomen.com for even more great content and, of course, to subscribe to the Oracle. Stay fierce, witches, and blessed be. Of Witches and Women is brought to you by SHH Media, LLC.